Here's everything you need to know about the Saturday morning session of General Conference. We had the new callings and sustainings of the general authorities in this session, the church auditing report. We got the speculated statement about wearing the temple garment and possibly a near-death experience from Elder Holland. As anticipated, the Sunday school presidency was reorganized. Mark Pace and his counselors were released from their service and in their place were called Paul V. Johnson from the 70, Chad H. Webb, who's been over seminaries and institutes, and Gabriel W. Reed, who is a former NFL player and currently serving as a mission president in Australia. The presidency of the 70 underwent significant changes. With Elder Kieran going to the Quorum of the Twelve, Marcus Nash took his place. We already knew this. It was announced in January. But then today, Elder Godoy, Brent Nielsen, and Paul Johnson were released from the presidency. And so four spots were filled with these guys. We've got Marcus B. Nash, which we already knew, Michael T. Ringwood, Arnulfo Valenzuela, and Edward Dubé. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland was the first up, and I was so glad to hear him speak again, but he strongly hinted that he's not long for this world. In classic Elder Holland style, he started off his talk joking that the reason he hasn't spoken so long is because his last talk must have just been so bad. He made reference to his time in the hospital recently, and he seemed to be alluding to a very special divine revelation he received when he was perhaps close to death, that he was admonished to return and to continue his mission to preach the gospel. I loved him talking about the profound effect the prayers of the church had on his health. He said that those prayers were heard by God and were answered, even if the prayers for his wife, Pat, weren't answered in the way that he had asked for. He talked about how prayers are the sweetest hour, the simplest, purest form of worship, and to encourage us to pray out loud when it allows. Sister Dennis has been the center of controversy for her bold statements about women in the church. And in this session, she continued to preach truth specifically about the temple garment. I'm not gonna lie, this is Definitely my favorite talk of the session. I felt like it was a really theologically grounded, doctrinally grounded, historically grounded talk, giving all sorts of insights about the temple and our covenants and the temple clothing we wear, both the temple garment and the ceremonial robes. Super beautiful. She said that those who have made covenants wear sacred ceremonial clothing in temple worship. And also we wear the garment of the holy priesthood in our everyday lives. And this is a rare reference to temple clothing so publicly in conference. She explained the beautiful symbolism behind the temple garment. The idea is that Adam and Eve were covered in animal skins when they left the Garden of Eden, likely meaning that an animal was sacrificed to cover their nakedness. The garment symbolizes how the atonement of Jesus Christ covers our sins and endows us with Christ's armor of light. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that this ancient insight has finally made its way to the general conference pulpit. She taught that our willingness to wear the garment every day is a sign to God, not to others, of our commitment to and our love for God. There are tangible symbols of the Savior's sacrifice, such as the marks in his hands and his side. So by wearing the temple garment, our lives can also become a symbol of our deep love for Jesus Christ. She taught that the bottom line is that our covenant and those symbols of those covenants are about our relationship with God, specifically our Hebrew chesed relationship with him or loving kindness. It's our choice to draw near to him through the adherence to our covenants. And I loved that she was including a lot of this Hebrew historical background in her talk. Elder Dushku dropped some truth about spiritual experiences or rather the lack thereof. Instead of getting discouraged because you yourself haven't experienced a Joseph Smith level pillar of light, still pay attention to those maybe less sensational, less spectacular, but just as divine rays of light that come through constant revelation. It was really inspiring. He gave a lot of examples from his own life of where he didn't feel like he's ever had a pillar of light. He's never had this insane, crazy manifestation, but instead he's had tons of small experiences that have built his testimony and all of us should feel the same way. Elder Suarez spoke about having confidence, powerful confidence, the kind that comes through having a sure knowledge of God's plan and in his covenants. He emphasized preparing better for the temple, which you know I am excited about. He said, as we change our preparation to enter the temple, we will change our experience in the temple, which will transform our lives outside of the temple. Love that quote. Elder Jack M. Gerard made a very interesting discourse on integrity. He said that Christian kindness is not a substitute for true integrity. If I understood him correctly, he's talking about how being kind is obviously important, just as following the second great commandment is important. But having true integrity also means being true to the first great commandment to love God, by standing by church doctrine and living a life that won't cause regrets or embarrassment later. Another quote from him is that the worldly pull can be as direct as to destroy fidelity in marriage or as subtle 
as posting anonymous comments critical of church doctrine or culture. Exercising integrity in our choices is an outward expression of an inner commitment to follow the Savior, Jesus Christ. The final speaker was President Henry B. Eyring, and his talk was pre-recorded. Uh, a few days ago, President Nelson posted on social media to kind of be prepared for several people giving their talks, either pre-recorded or sitting down due to the effects of age, and Elder Eyring was the first one in this conference to do that. He started his talk talking about his experience while he was living in Idaho when the Teton Dam broke and how he and his wife drew strength through that really hard time through their knowledge of their temple covenants that bind them to God and bind them to each other eternally. He encouraged people to make and keep sacred covenants in the temple. There was a ton of temple emphasis and covenant emphasis in this session. Recap of the Saturday afternoon session of General Conference. For the first time in a while, at least, a member of the First Presidency did not conduct, but rather Elder Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Elder Bednar used a cool object lesson on the mechanics of a strong foundation by using steel poles within the foundation to attach it to the underlying bedrock. He used that to teach how we need to attach our foundation to the rock of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We attach our foundation to Christ through sacred time and sacred space, such as worshiping a church or in the temple. But our homes should be the ultimate culmination of sacred time and sacred space. Elder Massimo De Feo, inspired by his own vision loss, spoke about what it takes for us to have clear spiritual vision. He mentioned declaring our testimonies of the Savior louder, and when we assume that we're the way that we are and we just can't change, we're being acted upon and not acting for ourselves. Elder Nielsen, who just got released from the presidency of the 70, spoke on the importance of our witness and our testimony of the gospel in light of his own professional and educational experience in legal trials. Elder Jose Alonso spoke on making Jesus Christ the center of our lives so that we can build our foundation, have increased revelation, feel the overwhelming love of our Savior and strength to overcome and peace to surpass all understanding. Elder Gong spoke on adversity and trials and the importance of keeping an eternal perspective in God's plan. Sometimes it's important to know that things will work out for our good even when we don't know how. And he included another reference to the temple robes when he told the story of a woman who wanted to serve in the temple in her temple clothes and then be buried in them. And she was. Michael T. Nelson of the Young Men's Presidency spoke on Book of Mormon examples like Helaman and Captain Moroni to illustrate the purposes and structures of our wards and stakes to help the youth of Zion specifically. Bishops need to have a laser-like focus on the youth to help their own spiritual maturity and development. Finally, Elder Quinton L. Cook spoke on quite a few different things, but he focused on the first principles and ordinances of the gospel like baptism. He included a discussion on the philosophical concept of free will and how we do have moral agency to choose God so that we can become one with Jesus Christ. Recap of the Saturday evening session of General Conference. To me, it kind of felt like an unofficial youth session, and I'm totally here for it. And this is the first time I've ever heard Amazing Grace sung in conference personally, and I'm hoping maybe it means it'll be included in the hymn book, but I have no idea. Probably shouldn't be reading between the lines like that. Pretty much the entirety of Elder Shane Bowen's talk, my mouth, my jaw just like dropped. <laughs> he was sharing story after story of miraculous and sometimes tragic priesthood power. One story was like of him experiencing a miraculous, like, I don't know, like premonition or prophecy when he was in jail serving a mission in Chile and he didn't know if he was going to get out alive. There was another one where his grandfather gave his lifeless mother a priesthood blessing and called her back to life. And then another one where his own family was driving and got in a car crash and his daughter got crushed under the van and they immediately gave her a priesthood blessing and brought her back to life. It was just, wow. Elder Bangeter spoke to the youth about a topic I have not heard for a while in General Conference, and that's for ordination. He spoke about how knowing God's plan for you, even before you were born, can bring perspective as you face the crossroads of your life. Sister Spinouse used the story of David and Goliath to share five principles for defeating spiritual giants in your life, just like David used five stones. And that's uh, the stone of your love for God, faith in Jesus Christ, knowledge of your identity, daily repentance, access to God's power, and then she added a bonus sixth stone of testimony. Elder Matthew Carpenter gave a really holistic discourse on the purposes of celestial marriage. And what was interesting is he talked about sealing cancellations, which personally I had never heard talked about openly over the pulpit before. He spoke about how we need to be sealed as a man and a woman for the highest exaltation in eternal life, and that the sealing ordinance creates both a lateral bond between the man and the woman and a vertical bond between the couple and God. As I mentioned, he also talked about sealing cancellations, and this is when a man and a woman get married and sealed in the temple. They are both getting a civil marriage and an eternal sealing. So when a couple gets divorced, that civil marriage does dissolve and the couple is no longer living together. The marriage is over, but the sealing remains intact unless there is a formal sealing cancellation, and that request has to go all the way up through the first presidency. 
And he talked about how when a couple gets a divorce, especially when one spouse was maybe unfaithful to their covenants and another spouse was, that faithful spouse may request a sealing cancellation to kind of distance themselves spiritually from that spouse, to undo the ties and the eternities. But he actually counseled against that, saying the person who is faithful to their covenants will still receive the personal blessings of the sealing ordinance, and they also will not be tied to the unfaithful person in the eternities. And finally, Elder Uchtdorf talked about enduring happiness, the kind that lasts. He started off with the caveat that a lot of people do struggle with mental health issues, and people can get help with finding that happiness through mental health professionals. But also part of what gives life joy and meaning is that opposition and those times of trials. And people can have joy in lots of hobbies, and noble pursuits here on earth. But at the end of the day, all earthy things will pass away, but godly joy is eternal because God is eternal. Recap of the Sunday morning session of General Conference. We got a follow-up statement on wearing the temple garment and some other inspiring messages. Elder Rasman spoke about how words matter. The Lord's words, the prophet's words, and our words. He even related a story where he was up in the middle of the night before dedicating the Bangkok Thailand temple because he just couldn't put it out of his mind. He felt that the prophet's words were missing. And so he added the line, may we think celestial, letting thy spirit prevail in our lives and strive to be peacemakers always. When talking about our own words that we can improve, he says we should utilize a lot more of the phrases, thank you, I'm sorry, and I love you. Sister Susan H. Porter spoke to the children about prayer and how we should pray to know grow, and show. Prayer, as simple as it is, can help us connect to God, give us experiences for our own development, and develop charity and love for others. Elder Renlund used his experience capsizing in a kayak to emphasize the importance of momentum and continuing to paddle to avoid disruptions. Spiritual momentum involves following the doctrine of Christ, daily repentance, faith in Christ, baptism. And I really liked his clarification that covenants are not the source of our power, but rather they are the conduit for receiving God's power. Elder Paul V. Piper used the exercise of a trust fall to talk about the nature of our trust in God. Sometimes when we are betrayed by imperfect mortals, it can make us really hard to want to trust again, even in a perfect God. He shared the experience of when he was at a law firm, it was downsizing and he was facing no job, no health insurance, right as his daughter was being born with severe health complications. So he questioned why they felt led to make some of these decisions that led up to this point. And in that hard circumstance, he learned that the best way to learn to trust God is just to trust him. And he stood amazed at the miracles he witnessed in that process. Best joke of conference goes to newest apostle, Elder Kieran, when he said that behind every new apostle stands an astonished mother-in-law. And the fact that his mother-in-law is no longer with us does nothing to reduce her astonishment. More seriously though, his talk was a powerhouse of how God is in pursuit of you. The Father's plan is to bring us home, not to keep us out. He's not trying to put up roadblocks. He didn't stay away from the leper or the woman with the issue of blood. He seeks after them and he seeks after us. Because Christ is never going to give us up, Elder Kieran made not just one, but two epic conference jokes because he basically just rickrolled us all. Elder Brian K. Taylor talked about what do we do when some people get miracles but not others, when some have struggles while others don't. And he gave three principles for dealing with these trials, that stronger faith comes from putting Jesus Christ first, brighter hope comes by envisioning your eternal destiny, Destiny, and greater power comes from focusing on joy. Finally, Elder Oaks spoke about the role of temples and covenants in our worship, and this is where we got the additional elaboration on the importance of wearing the temple garment. He explained that we elect to give up certain freedoms for the benefits of living in a community, for example, by having law enforcement, judges, emergency personnel, etc. Likewise, missionaries wear symbolic clothing by wearing, you know, white shirt, tie, name tag, to signal to others their role in preaching the gospel, and it's also to remind the wearer of the commitments they've made to represent Jesus Christ. Same with wedding rings, it's a signal to others and a reminder to ourselves. Same thing with the temple garment. We wear the temple garment every day faithfully for those same reasons. It signals our role as disciples and it's also a reminder of our commitments. We wear them because of covenants. And it seems like we've been hearing a lot more about covenants in recent years, but from the beginning of the restoration, it was always about covenants, which is what Elder Oaks explained. We don't always appreciate the covenant vision when it comes to the early events of the restoration because we're often thinking of like the first vision in the Book of Mormon, but it was explicit that all of this is because of a broken covenant that God wanted to restore, which culminated in the institution of the endowment in Nauvoo. He really laid out just very clearly the importance of why we make covenants and how they bring us back to God. And because of that, why we need to be wearing the temple garment every day. Our covenants just don't take a day off. So we need to be you know, committed to that symbol of our worship. Recap of the Sunday afternoon session at General Conference. We got 15 temples 
and a whole lot of discussion about temples in general. Elder Christofferson spoke on the three kingdoms of glory as outlined in D&C 76. He pointed out that our qualifications for each kingdom has everything to do with how valiant we are in the testimony of Jesus. And he shared the example of a man who was valiant in his testimony of Jesus in a small branch in Hawaii when he and his family were shamed for participating in the sacrament while his daughter had a disease. But this man humbled himself and said, you know what, this is not the branch president's church, this is Christ's church, and we have to do everything we can to be true to our testimony of him despite personal insult. Taylor Godoy used a humorous story of the chaotic events that led to him and his wife finally getting able to be legally married to illustrate five principles about relying on the Lord. Number one, always think of the Lord as your first option for help. Number two, call, don't fall, use the power of prayer. Number three, after praying, do all you can to obtain the blessings. Four, humble yourself to accept the answer in his time and in his way. And number five, don't stop. Keep moving forward on the covenant path while you wait for your answer. Gary Stevenson compared the two massive towers of a suspension bridge to the two great commandments, love the Lord and love thy neighbor as thyself. Both of these pillars are dependent on each other, so we can't neglect one to be truly obeying the other. Then Elder Matthias Held spoke, and I'm not gonna lie, this is when the Sunday afternoon stupor and sleepies just kind of hit. No hate to him. I just did not sleep very much last night. But from what I understand, he talked about trials and adversity and how our attitudes define us more than our challenges. And because of our agency, we can still choose to follow God's commandments, even despite our personal circumstances. Elder Neil Anderson spoke on the amazing progress of temple building and the blessings of temple worship. He showed how many temples are being built in the Philippines right now. He also shared an experience while when he was in the temple, completely by chance, he ended up successively doing the initiatory endowment and sealing of a man named Eliezer Cerci, and he looks forward to meeting him one day in heaven. Mark L. Pace spoke on the importance of getting a witness of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon for yourself. Even as a young boy, his mother understood the importance of this and so challenged him to read the Book of Mormon by himself and pray about it. He felt that testimony then, and that can be our experience now as we studied the Book of Mormon this year for Come Follow Me. President Nelson gave a pre-recorded seated message and he announced 15 temples. You can see the whole list on the church newsroom or pause at the beginning of the video when I showed the screenshot. He also gave a very well-rounded discourse on the priesthood keys that made the restoration and the temple possible. The priesthood keys are what distinguish our church from others as the true church and more than just a social or humanitarian organization. The priesthood keys given by Jesus Christ and Moses and Elijah in the Kirtland temple allow for ordinances like ceilings to last beyond this mortal life. He asked us to ponder on three statements that one, the gathering of Israel is evidence that God loves all of his children everywhere. Two, the gospel of Abraham is further evidence that God loves all of his children everywhere and he invites all to come unto him. And three, the ceiling power is supernal evidence of how much God loves all of his children everywhere. Basically, he's just laying out how the gospel, the priesthood ordinances, the priesthood keys, the temple, the whole plan is intended for God to be able to bring his children back to him because he loves us. And he counseled that nothing will help you hold fast to the iron rod, obtain peace and blessings as attending the temple as much as your circumstances allow. And then he just dropped the entire list of 15 temples. So I feel like this conference was like 80% temples. It was amazing. It was inspiring. I am so looking forward to studying all of these messages this year and then looking forward to conference again in six months.